Good morning, everybody. It's very good to see you uh, this morning. Uh, if you are a regular member of our congregation, it's good to see you. If you're a guest with us, uh, you're very uh, welcome, and also welcome to those who are watching online. And if you're uh, watching online, uh, checking us out, you'd be welcome to come and join us uh, in person uh, some week. We're going to begin uh, by worshiping. We're going to join with some liturgy that comes up on the screen. So if you're able to stand, will you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Sing to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. The Lord is our light and our life. Let's sing all heaven declares. to the Lord in confession. We're going uh, to take a few moments uh, to say sorry uh, for the things that we've done, uh, the things that we've said, the things that we've maybe thought that, that have been wrong. Um, we're going to confess those uh, to him. Uh, also in the expectation and the confidence that he's a God who forgives us. So let's take a few moments in quiet to confess those things. Join together with the words set on the screen, beginning, Almighty God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we've sinned against you in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The collect of today. Lord of life, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted upon the cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restore to humanity all that was lost through sin. Be with us in your risen power, 
that in word and deed we may proclaim the marvellous mystery of death and resurrection. For all praise is yours now and throughout eternity. Amen. Since uh, Easter Sunday, we've been looking at Luke chapter 24, um, different interactions that Jesus had in his resurrected form with, uh, with his followers. And this morning, Sandra's going to read um, verses 36 to 43. This is a clue for any of the children following along with your activity pack where you might want to take a note of the reading. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 43. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sandra. One of the things that I like already about this church is that there's so many Liverpool supporters. Um, so well done for all the Liverpool supporters. And <laughs> just an excuse to put up an image, uh, there we go, uh, that reminds me uh, of uh, one of the best experiences of my life. I was up there probably with my wedding day and the birth of my children, um, probably not before those, am I right? Yes, not before those uh, events, um, but I watched, uh, this is from the Champions League final, if you're not into football, it does have a link to what I'm going to talk about, so it's not just um, an excuse to show a picture of, of Liverpool Football Club. But Liverpool were in the Champions League final and they were playing AC Milan, one of the greatest teams uh, of the time. And at half time, Liverpool were being beat 3 0. I was watching it at a friend's house with a couple of mates. And uh, the guy whose house it was at, at half time said, Look, I'm away to walk the dog. There's no point staying to watch this. Obviously, we're not going uh, to win. But as all the Liverpool fans know, and all other football fans, Liverpool pulled it back. They scored one goal, then another then another, and it went to extra time, and at the end of the game, it was a draw. So it goes to penalties, and Liverpool win on penalties. This is the chance to cheer. Did it work? <laughs> so Liverpool win this game, and my friends and I, am um, sitting there sort of uh, quite dejected for a lot of the game, and as it goes on, we start to get a bit more excited, and a bit more, uh, we're anticipating that th this might actually be okay after all. And at the end of the game, we're there going like, I don't believe it. Like, did this actually happen? Did we actually win the Champions League from a place of no hope till we win the game? I, don't, I just don't believe it. I don't believe that that happened. Do you believe that this happened? I can't believe that it happened, but it did happen because we just watched it on the TV. Maybe you've had experiences like that where something has happened and you can't believe it. I don't believe that that happened. And you're sort of rubbing your eyes and think, am I seeing this correctly? I always think uh, of, of this, this man uh, whenever I talk about or say, like, I don't believe it, uh, Victor Meldrew uh, from uh, the TV programme, is it Keeping Up Appearances? And his catchphrase was, I don't believe it. Not when something good has happened, but whenever he sees something, and he, he has to believe it because it's in front of him, but he's like, I don't believe that this has happened. Another catastrophe has happened to me again and again. I don't uh, believe it. And the reading uh, today is part of Luke chapter 24, and it can be called the I don't believe it chapter. 
So you have at the start the women go to the tomb. The tomb is empty. And they're like, I don't believe it. The tomb is empty. What is going on here? And they run back to tell the rest of the disciples. The disciples say, we don't believe you. We don't believe it. Then Peter goes to the tomb and sees that it's empty. And he's wondering what's happened. Thinking, I don't believe it. The body isn't here. Last week, Irvine talked about the couple on the road to Emmaus who walked with Jesus. Jesus walked with them. They didn't recognize him. And they're saying, like, we don't believe it. Like, we had hoped that he was the Messiah. We had hoped that he'd come to rescue us. We had hoped, but their hopes had been shattered. And now he appears to the rest of the disciples, and they struggle to believe it. So what do we see? What might we learn from this passage? It's really interesting that Jesus comes into the midst of them and he says, peace be with you. So to a, peop a group of people filled with unbelief and confusion and turmoil, people who are wondering what had happened, he says, peace be with you. Shalom. You've maybe heard that phrase before, peace be with you. This is a normal greeting from the day, like saying hello. As we might say hello to someone or good morning, they would say shalom. But he meant the full meaning of it, peace be with you. When I was a student, I spent three summers working at a camp in America. And for the first number of days and weeks, I was really confused because I would walk past someone and say hi. And they'd stop and say, well, actually, it's going really well, thanks. And, or else I'm not having a great day. And I'm like, why are they telling me their life story? All I'm doing is saying hello. Not realizing that literally hi is short for hi, which is short for how are you? So I was saying hi just as a greeting. They were thinking I was really interested in how they were. It's a bit like asking someone, how are you? Oh great, how are you? Great. And then you walk on and we don't really, we're not really bothered about the whole story or how's it going? How's it going? We see that in the mornings, I walk our dog in Belmont Park and you go past other, other guys walking their dogs, say, how's it going? How's it going? That's a question, isn't it? That's asking, how's it going? How's your day going? Um, but we don't answer because it's just really a greeting. And quite often um, at this, in these days, people will say, shalom, shalom, and it's just a greeting. But Jesus here means peace be with you. I've come into your midst and there's a lack of peace. And he says, peace be with you. He really meant it. His desire for them was to be at peace. And he knew that they weren't. And his desire for us is the same. Shalom, peace, peace in our hearts, peace in our lives, peace in our minds. The reading tells us that they were startled and frightened thinking that they'd seen a ghost. Possibly the reason they thought they'd seen a ghost is because in another account, in a different gospel, it says that the door was closed and locked and then he appeared in the, in the midst of them. Another reason is that they maybe struggled to believe in the resurrection because there's quite a lot to ask. And another option is that possibly his resurrected body didn't look exactly like his previous body. So all these things are going on in their minds. They're thinking that the ghost has come in to their room. And he says, why are you troubled? Why did doubts rise in your minds? And a lot of people think this is a rebuke. A lot of people think that he's telling them off, but I'm not too sure. Belief in resurrection is really difficult. Jesus was dead. His body was dead. It was put in a tomb. A stone was rolled over the entrance to the tomb. It's really difficult. It was really difficult, difficult for them to believe in the resurrection. So maybe it was a rebuke, maybe it was a gentle telling off, but maybe it was just saying, look, I, I get it. This is really difficult to understand. I think he was maybe saying to them, it's okay to be troubled about things. It's okay to have doubts and questions about, the, about your faith. I think he's acknowledging their legitimate troubles and doubts, but he wants to move them on, move them on from there. There's other examples in the Bible of people who doubted and people who struggled. At doubting Thomas is the name we give to one of the disciples. Thomas, who, who said, like, I'm not really sure if it's actually you, unless I see the wounds, unless I see um, the actual the piercings in your body, I'll not believe it. But when he was shown 
Then whenever Jesus said, well, let me show you, he renewed his faith and this confirmed his identity. He continued as an apostle. He was there at Pentecost. He was there as part of the early church. Or what about King David? A man described as being after God's own heart. But a lot of the Psalms he wrote questions God, questioned God's intentions and his provision with often raw and angry language. What about the story of Job in the Old Testament? Job who voiced his doubts and disillusionment in very strong terms. The Bible has a lot of examples of people who questioned, people who doubted, and people who were troubled in their faith. In this story, it says, why are you troubled and why did doubts rise in your minds? But look at my hands and my feet, it is myself. Touch me and see. In a way, Jesus was saying, look, I acknowledge that you're troubled. I acknowledge that you have doubts about this, but engage with me, interact with me, touch me and see. With Thomas and David and Job, they had doubts, questions, they were disillusioned, they were troubled, but each of them engaged with God in those. One writer explains that there's different uh, shades or different types of doubt. He says one shade of doubt is intellectual for those who really want to see the evidence and really want to see all of the proof before they'll believe or before they'll trust. Or people who, who read something in the Bible, who, who come to something that they really struggle with theologically. Another uh, group of people with doubts are those with institutional doubts. These are people who struggle uh, with how the church operates. They struggle with things that have happened in the church and through the church. And a belief that the church is not what it ought to be. A lot of them would say, I love Jesus, but I really struggle with church. Or people with transitional doubts. Uh, something happens in life. There's bereavement. There's a crisis. There's an illness. Or someone going through a, a particular life stage. So a lot of young Christians as they go to university really struggle with their faith as they encounter new ways uh, of life, they encounter new ways of thinking about things. Or maybe it's retirement, where retirement comes and people struggle with that. And all these things can impact our faith. So are you troubled? Do you have questions? Maybe you have doubts, maybe you're even disappointed or angry uh, with God. But I think what we see from the passage today is people who struggled, people who were troubled, people who had doubts were invited to engage with him. Jesus said, come, engage with me, touch and see. So what do we do if we have doubts? What do we do if we have questions? What do we do if we hit something and we really struggle or are troubled? From this passage, I think we're called to engage with God. Uh, sometimes we're good at other people, we're good at our friends, but this isn't always a great thing to do because sometimes they'll maybe not push us towards God. Sometimes it's like, yeah, like, come on, we'll go uh, down a different route. A lot of younger generations go online, they go on social media and on the forums and they're attracted away uh, from God. It's a trajectory away from him, but I think it's more helpful if we're pulled towards him. Even to say, God, I, I have questions, I have doubts, I have troubles, but I still trust you for the answers, for resolution, for the way forward. Another problem we might have is unexpressed doubt. If we keep it to ourselves, it becomes unresolved. If we don't do anything about it, nothing changes and we stay where, you, where we are. So what do we do if we have these doubts? What do we do if we have questions? What, if we do, what do we do if we say to God, I see what you're saying, I read what you're saying, but I, I struggle to accept that. There's things going on in my life that really bother me. There's things that are going on that really trouble me. My life is not all sweet. Well, being at church is a step. Even if you're watching at home, engaging with the church community is a good, a good step. Praying honest prayers is a good thing. Expressing how you're feeling, expressing to God how or what you're thinking. This is what David did, this is what Job did. I think quite often we think it's a sin to express doubt or to ask questions, 
or to tell God that we don't understand what's going on. I don't think that's a sin. I think that's honesty. We can go to our Bibles and ask him to speak to us through his word. We can talk to others. In the book of Proverbs, on numerous occasions, it says that we should seek wise counsel. Maybe this is a trusted friend who's further along the path or someone who's walking with us. Processing and dealing with our doubts and our questions is a good thing, and it can be a good thing for our faith. Frederick Buchner, who's a theologian and author, he says that doubt is the ants in the pants of faith because it forces you to move. It forces you to get up and do something about it. And he writes that uh, that doubts and engaging with God with our doubts and through our doubts can be a powerful motivator toward a more complete and genuine spiritual life. If we have doubts, if we have questions, if we're troubled and we don't do anything uh, about them, we don't progress, we don't move on and we're stuck in them. I believe what Jesus is saying and what God is saying to us through the passage is, I understand, I acknowledge those, but come to me, take a step towards me, engage with God. They say that every journey begins with a step. My encouragement is to make a step towards engaging with God in your doubt and your troubles, engaging with him with your questions and allow him to minister to you as Jesus ministered to the doubts and troubled minds of these disciples. And for those of us who maybe aren't in a place where we have doubts at the minute or we don't have questions, we aren't troubled, what do we do? Let's be people who encourage those who are struggling. Let's be people who say to our friends, look, I see that you're struggling. I see that you have doubts. I see that you have questions, but let's, let's bring them to God. Let's move towards God with them. The perception of the church is that we're not often a people, it's not often a place that's safe and hospitable to express doubts or to ask questions. This is a belief of younger generations that if they grew up in the church but struggle with things of faith, struggle with Christianity, that they don't ask the questions, you don't admit that you have doubts. Church should be the place, or more importantly, should be the people where we're comfortable to ask questions and express our doubts in the context of a loving community who want the best for each other. Let's be people who help one another through the difficulties of life in times of trouble and doubts and with questions and we spur one another on towards God. Jesus said to the disciples, it is I myself, touch me and see. What he said is experience for yourself you see, the disciples were hearing stories of resurrection from others. Now Jesus is saying, see for yourselves. The old understanding of a priest was that he would interact with God on behalf of the people. But Jesus was saying, Jesus was teaching, interact directly with me and with God. Ephesians 3 and 12 says, in, in him, in Jesus, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. There's no criteria here, there's no, like, as long as you don't have doubts, as long as you don't have questions, as long as you don't have troubles, it says, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And then Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There's mercy and grace in God to help us in our time of need. I think that's something worth hearing. There's mercy and grace in God to help us in our time of need. In Psalm 34 verse 8 it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You can't taste for someone else. Last week I overheard someone here talking about uh, strawberries and how great strawberries are at the minute and I love strawberries and I thought I don't want to hear other people talking about how good strawberries are. I want to taste some myself. You can't taste through someone else. God's inviting each of us to deeper relationship with him, ourselves, not through someone else, not hearing other people's stories. And at the end of the passage, he says, do you have anything here to eat? And he took it, took it and ate it 
in their presence. In a sense, he was having a fish supper with them. I posted an image during the week on, on our Facebook page, and it's one of the most interactive images we've had because I put a fish supper on. And I love that in this interaction, it takes place in the ordinary. Jesus said, let's sit down and let's have some fish. Probably wasn't battered and deep fried uh, the way we would eat it. Um, but he says, let's sit down, let's eat uh, together. And one person has written that Jesus was often uh, at a meal, on the way to a meal, on the way from a meal, or talking about a meal. And if not, he's talking about another everyday, normal event. The invitation that we have is to encounter and engage with God in the everyday. How do I do it? I walk the dog. Sometimes it's when I'm driving and I turn off the radio. Sometimes it's when we're in church. And for some people it's as they cook, it's as they do the dishes, as they cut the grass, or sitting on a bench, maybe you go fishing, whatever it is, it's an everyday thing. God's desire is relationship with us all day and every day in the ordinary, regardless of how strong we think our faith is, regardless of how much we think we deserve it, regardless of the doubts and the questions. The final image I have is of the famous uh, statue in Brazil, and the statue, huge big statue of Jesus, with his arms wide open. Part of the meaning of this is the, the image of Jesus on the cross with his arms wide open. But I also love the imagery of God with his arms wide open, receiving us and come to me, come to me. It's an invitation to all. It's an invitation to come and touch and see. It's an invitation to come and taste and see that God is good. And he says, come to me, come to me with your doubts, come to me with your concerns, come to me with your questions, come to me in your troubles but come to me. We've been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and part of that teaches us that Jesus is alive today and he's there sitting at the right hand of God and they're engaging with us in relationship and we can experience God through his Holy Spirit. He's saying, come, engage with me in relationship. Well, let me walk with you throughout your every day, through the good times, through the difficult times. But because Jesus died and was resurrected, if we put our trust in him, we can have a relationship with God. And as I said, it doesn't matter how much we know, how little we, we know. It doesn't matter how many questions we have. It doesn't matter if we're really confident in our faith or really questioning our faith. It's this relationship with the arms wide open uh, of God saying, come to me, walk with me. Let me engage with you. And as Jesus ministered to these disciples, God wants to minister to us in our needs. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your open arms. We thank you for your arms wide open. We thank you that you accept us regardless of where we're at in our faith because it doesn't depend on us, it depends on you. So today, we stand with those who are troubled, we stand with those who have questions, we stand with those who have doubts. And we also admit or acknowledge our own questions, our own doubts, but we trust you and we believe you are a good God. We believe that you have goodness for us. We believe that you offer us life in all its fullness. We ask that you help us to draw closer to you, help us to come to you in honesty and in openness. And as we do that, would you minister to us? Would you minister to our doubts? Would you minister in our troubles? Would you minister to our questions? We thank you for your grace and mercy in times of trouble. And help each of us to encourage one another. Help each of us to encourage each other towards you. 
give us grace and mercy for one another. Father, we continue to pray for the Queen and the royal family as they mourn the death of Prince Philip. We ask that you give her strength and give them strength. We pray for those in our congregation who are in mourning and who grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray that you comfort them through your Holy Spirit. We pray for those who are ill in any way. We pray for those who are living through pain. We pray for those who are waiting for results or appointments. We pray for your healing. And even for any of us in, in the church this morning or those watching at home, we pray that you would be moving in your power. We pray for healing. We pray for those in our community in financial and practical need. Give us opportunities to help those in need. We believe it's your desire that none would go hungry and none that would go without. God, help us to live out our faith in such a way that people see Jesus in us and would be drawn to you. Amen. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer and the words will come up on the screen. Our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you're able to stand, will you stand with us? We're going to affirm our faith. Do you believe and trust in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a modern hymn called Christ is Mine Forevermore. It may not be familiar to a lot of you, but we have, uh, we used it in some of our recorded services uh, during lockdown. Um, and it's quite a straightforward song uh, to sing, but it's got amazing words. So even uh, just think about the words as we're singing.
stay standing for the last uh, few moments. A couple of announcements. Uh, one is that our online Bible study uh, will start again this week um, on Zoom uh, from 7.30. And we'll send out the details about that um, in an email uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, also, we communicated this week about some opportunities uh, to get involved serving in the life of the church. Um, so if anybody would be interested, one opportunity is to join our, our welcome team who say hello at the little tables and sort of sanitize your hands and so on. Um, all you need is a smiley face, so if you would be keen to get involved in that, um, speak to me. And the other is to join our, our team uh, for the prayer line, so we have a phone number that people can text or call for uh, prayer requests. Um, so one thing is to encourage you to use that, so if you know someone who isn't well, someone who has a need um, that we could pray for, please send it through. And um, We don't need to give details of names or anything like that, but we also want to expand the number of people who will pray uh, for those need so if you could do that you would receive a message whenever a request comes in and also uh, speak to me and finally uh, at our general vestry meeting during the week our new select vestry was appointed um, the church wardens are still the same it's still ray and roy so well done to the bouncers for being elected again it was a tough competition um, i'll email out the details of the different members of, of vestry during the week as well so you know that who they are so as we leave, there's an opportunity to give uh, your offering in the baskets on the way out. Let's join together with the words on the screen. Grant, O Lord. Grant, O Lord, that as we leave this house, we may not leave your presence. Be ever near us and keep us close to you, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.